letter below was discovered at Morton Heritage and Historical Center by the current curator, Mr. Archie Tanner. The note was found inside a box that had been carefully concealed in a cavity beneath the floorboards in the back storeroom of the center and was written in 2000 by Mr. Gerard Warbutton, who sadly passed away in 2002. Also in the same box was the chain to which the note refers. It's an item which the present curator has decided should not be put back on public display. To whomever it may concern, on the 19th October 1999, my friend Arnold Monks and I committed a crime. Without reservation and in full knowledge of what we were planning to do, we committed criminal damage, stole an item of great monetary and historical value from the Morton Heritage and Historical Center. Not that anyone would know. We staged a burglary, which involved me concealing my identity by wearing a hooded top so as not to be recognized on CCTV and throwing a brick through the windows of the center. I then removed an item so that Arnold could do away with it. We then filed a police report claiming that the item had been stolen by thugs and made false witness statements to that effect. I am making this statement now and leaving here papers firstly because at 93, I don't expect to live much longer and secondly because Arnold passed away earlier this year and I don't want future employees or historians stumbling across the artifact without the benefit of being well informed. Up until his untimely death a few months ago, the Heritage and Historical Center in Morton was run by a friend of mine named Arnold Monks. The place itself, which functions as sort of a hybrid between a museum and a tourist information center, is not as large as a grand title might suggest and is basically just a few average sized shop fronts knocked together with display cases on either side and the back room lined with shelves. A wander around and a quick glance at these shelves will reveal them to be full of curiosities, posters, documents, and artifacts from the town's long and storied history, but not enough to occupy more than a half hour of any general tourist time or interest. In fact, much of what I and indeed Arnold might have considered to be more of the interesting parts of Morton's history are deliberately kept from view, often with good reason. The center itself is close to the railway station, so the few visitors that do come to Morton, stopping over on their way to somewhere else or using it as a base to explore the hills and moors around it, can find the center quite easily, tucked between a charity shop and a restaurant just off the main town square. It's from the Heritage Center that events like the Heritage Weekend that takes place every year are organized and where any and all ephemera relating to the town eventually winds up for Arnold to either enthuse over or put on display file away in a box in the storeroom, or move to the circular file which was his polite name for the bin. Of course, being the local historian in a place like Morton wasn't always easy. Running the center was not just a matter of recording the local history accurately, but of using that history to encourage people both to come to the place and to take an interest in the local heritage. Archiving those things in a town where local whispers hiss with tales of strange happenings whilst louder voices in nearby cities share rumors of Morton as a somewhat sinister and haunted place can be difficult. Many times Archie confessed to me his frustration at the requirement for him to put on a positive spin on the things he chose to display or to file away for later consideration those stories and facts that did not exactly paint the town as a pleasant place to visit. Archie, after all, it should be remembered, was paid by the council as part of the town's drive to bring in tourists. Were he to display in the Heritage Center the sort of information that would have the opposite effect, scaring people or adding to the already dark reputation, he would soon find himself not running the Heritage Center but queuing at the Job Center instead. Whilst the true historian in him would consider it almost sacrilegious to destroy or ignore any evidence of a narrative that went against the happy-clappy image of Morton, the part of him that liked to pay his rent and afford luxuries like food and heating, knew when the time was right to keep quiet. Keeping your mouth shut, he used to say, is a good way to ensure that you can keep filling it. Whilst I often joked that he was engaged in some kind of historical cover-up, like a cheap budget store version of the X-Files set in sleepy Little Morton, Archie did not regard this process of selective history editing as being anything of the sort. The evidence, he would argue, was all there, studiously researched and beautifully organized, 
any historian with the least bit of interest in exposing the dark underbelly of the town could sift through Archie's careful filing system and the meticulous notes he had taken over the years and find anything he was looking for with very little trouble. It was all there, packed away neatly in boxes and files, stacked one atop the other in the dusty cupboards that filled the back room of the Heritage Center or in folders kept at the Victorian Library. Nothing about the town's dark history was erased, classified, or even really hidden in any meaningful sense. It simply wasn't highlighted. It was all there, just never on display. Except that was for Halloween. Then, and only then, for a period of about three weeks, Archie would take his annual dive into the town's archives and place on display one relic, photo, or a piece of local history that had a darker history. His selection would occupy a special section in the center's window, and he would often explain the backstory in a column featured in the town's local newspaper. This, he argued, was okay because it was a special feature and he could plead to his bosses at the council that people wanted something a bit spooky at Halloween. The single lurid feature would draw people into the Heritage Center, where they could be confronted by all the more positive displays. It was an idea with which the council begrudgingly agreed. Both he and I would look forward to this annual bout of intellectual freedom and would spend many hours carefully sifting through the possible candidates for each year's display and he would take great pleasure in pulling out numerous curios and objects, the stories behind which would make many people's skin crawl. In 1999, Arnold decided that for this year's strange relic, he would display the town's original mayoral chain. For those who don't know, a mayoral chain is a piece of ceremonial jewelry worn by mayors in the way that a crown might be worn by an emperor or a king. Essentially, it is a chain made up of large interconnected metal links that rest across a mayor's neck, though more accurately around his shoulders, and drapes down in a sort of V-shape so that the center links rest upon the upper chest. The links were usually made from gold, polished brass or silver, and is worn by the mayor at official engagements and is a symbol of the office. The current mayoress of Morton is often pictured in the local newspaper wearing one as she congratulates school children or cuts the ribbon to open a new supermarket. Curiously, however, the mayoress does not wear the item that Archie was placing on display. Nor has this particular chain been worn by any mayor since the 17th century. On her official engagements, the current mayoress wears a modern, recast chain made in the 1950s, which seems a strange decision when an older, more traditional design chain with links to the royal family exists in the town's museum. You would think, in a town so keen to celebrate its history, that wearing this older piece of legacy adornment, linking the office back across the centuries would be something the council would like to do. Apparently, though, they have a very good reason for deciding against it. The original chain, Archie told me, was produced in the mid-17th century and was first worn by a man named Sir Arthur Wiggins. The tale around how this particular piece of jewelry became infamous relates directly to Sir Arthur's bid to become mayor. To bolster his reputation in the area and to build the reputation that would eventually see him rise to high office, Wiggins promised, in a document that Archie was able to show me, to rid the town and indeed the entire county from what he referred to as the scourge of witchcraft. Of course, in our more enlightened age, such a claim would have a candidate laughed out of the building. But back then, this promise was taken seriously and indeed act upon. Over the course of three months in the late autumn of 1641, Wiggins ordered the arrest and prosecution of no less than 12 individuals, mostly women, from Morton and the surrounding villages on charges of malficium, that is witchcraft. Among these individuals, mostly local faith healers and cunning folk, was one woman named Margaret Easton, with whom Wiggins struck gold in more ways than one. Unlike the other victims who went quietly with the authorities, protesting their innocence and praying to heaven that they would be vindicated, Easton was a very different story. Documents from the time show that upon her arrest, Easton, who was in her 80s and mostly blind, fought bitterly spitting at and cursing the authorities and the men that manhandled her. Possibly as a result of senility, 
She admitted publicly to performing hideous rites and threatening to bring ruin on the town and anyone associated with Wiggins and his cronies. She was eventually executed in January of 1642, after which Wiggins ordered that her home be razed to the ground. Upon investigation, however, it was revealed that Eastern's dwelling, where she had performed curative spells and operations for both the rich and poor of the area for decades, was also where she kept the profits of her labor. In an old potato sack by the fire, untouched and clearly never spent, was an immense collection of money and valuables. From gold pieces and rings to foreign coins and other pieces of jewelry, clearly handed over as payment for the old woman's services. Having uncovered this unexpected prize, Wiggins decided that the best way to use the gold was not, in fact, to donate it to the church or the poor and needy within the town, but instead to have it melted down, mixed with common brass and formed into the shape of a chain that could be worn by the new mayor as a symbol not only of his office, but of his commitment to stamping out demons and witches in the area. It is for this reason that the piece was often referred to as the Witchfinder's Chain. It is also why so many strange rumors and folktales were linked to it. Over the next 18 years, Morton had a run of 24 mayors, which considering that the mayoral term was supposed to be five years, is an extraordinarily high number. Not only that, but there were long periods within those years where the councils had difficulty finding someone who would take the job since every single person who did seemed to die very soon after, often in violent or mysterious circumstances. Kicked by a horse, crushed by a collapsing wall or dying in a freak accident by falling down the stairs were amongst the reasons given. Which of course led to rumors that the chain itself was cursed. This chain of bad luck was eventually broken by the 25th mayor to take the role after Wiggins, when he insisted that he would only take the job if a new mayoral chain was made and he would not be forced to wear it at any point or even touch the original, which was then retired and put on display in the town hall for many years before being packed away and forgotten about in the 19th century, until it was uncovered years later by Arnold. Choosing to put the chain on display, Arnold did his usual routine of writing about the thing's long history in the newspaper, and indeed many of the town's local residents did come during the first two weeks of October to see the famous Witchfinder's chain. This would have been the end of the story. The chain would have been taken down, packed away, and forgotten about again. Had Arnold not received a letter from our current mayoress? In her short note, she explained that she thought it would be a good giggle to wear the chain for her engagement on Halloween night and requested that Arnold make it available to her. Now, I'm not what you might call a superstitious man, but when Arnold explained this to me and how terrified he was about the prospect of having to hand over the piece, I initially thought he was overreacting. That was until he told me about Tim Levin. Tim was a rather badly behaved young man who had quite the reputation at the local Catholic school. Having come into the Heritage Center with his mates on his way home one night, he had thought it would be a hilarious prank for him to remove the chain from the mannequin and parade around the center wearing it. After being told off by Arnold and throwing some abuse his way, Tim replaced the chain and, still giggling stupidly, dashed out of the center, throwing up the V signs at my friend and not watching where he was going. Tim, Arnold explained, stepped out into the road and was hit by a car less than two minutes after wearing the chain. He is recovering well, but will walk with a limp for the rest of his life. So, to avoid the current mayor ever having a chance to wear the piece, we disappeared it. I hope that whoever discovers this note will understand our reasons and choose wisely what to do with the thing now.